Hello. The floor is yours, ladies. <laughs> All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. I'm MP uh, from the Department of Decentralization. And we're here to present a, a short recap on our second research project. Our first research project on the intersection between technology and art, not and maybe not blockchain, but technology and art, uh, was uh, started in January 2019 with a discussion during Girlicon. And then it was further continued with a, a paper in June 2019, where we presented our first assumptions on the matter. Uh, turns out that uh, the paper were, uh, went really well. It created a lot of really positive reaction, but no actions were taken. So we decided to embark again into a second iteration and a deeper dive combined with some uh, with uh, you know some other uh, stuff that we're doing such as a game that's being led by Beth who is here with us and uh, Stina also introduced a book the pedagogy of the oppressed by Paulo Freire and we're gonna mash it up together and we're gonna discuss all of that so without further ado uh, I'm going to ask you these questions. What do culture workers and crypto anarchists have in common? Well, they have in common that most of the work is actually born out of their frustration towards oppression. So, and this is only the very, very high level layer. So if you even explore it deeper down, you will find a lot of similarities. So I'm going to pass it to Stina so that we can kick off uh, the proper talk. Stina? Uh, can I get my slide, please? Um, so I've got two small notes just before I start the presentation. One, um, please do not hesitate to ask us any questions, but Beth, MP and myself would really appreciate if you could save it to after the presentation. And two, in our first report, there is no such thing as blockchain art. We spoke about democratization of the art world. Um, however, for the new coming report, we are going to reconsider that phrase as we believe that it just simplifies the problems a bit too much. It's definitely something that needs to be done, but it's this and then also a lot more. Next, please. Uh, next slide, please. So just looking at some of the problems in the art world, um, even before COVID-19 hit us, um, it was quite a problematic industry and it was in need of a lot of systematic change. And since the beginning of this year, it's become even more problematic because all culture, cultural workers has been hit really hard. A lot of uh, contracts has disappeared, etc. But since this is a problem that's affecting not only the art world, but the whole world, I'm actually not gonna focus on what we currently have, but I'm gonna focus on what it looked like before this whole situation. Um, and with that, it meant that precarious work is now the rule and not an exception. So what does this actually mean? Next slide, please. Um, there has there has been quite a lot of active mobilization in in the in the art world within the last few years. Um, there's still massive problems of unfair wages in the sector, illegal unpaid internships, unpaid overtime, exploitation by institutions and bosses, and precariousness of freelance and temporary work. And there is still a really long way to go, and much of the reality for the workers within this industry is exactly this, that you are expected to take on internships for free, even though it's illegal. You are expected to take on projects for free, and you're also expected to be okay with extremely low wages. Um, so we also have a, a thing called uh, zero hour contracts, which I know exists within other industries as well, but with that comes also no access to pension schemes, no access to paid leave or paid sick leave or any other kind of security that a contract might bring. You can always have the discussion if a contract is the right way to go. However, in the current situation, I think that's something that's very, very uh, tempting to go down because it will actually give you more power than what you currently have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, on top of this, 
working with uh, from the from the previous report that we wrote, it also has become very uh, apparent that it's quite common that the industry itself is. Um, simplified to the fact that it's only made up of artists, but that's actually not true. Um, it's a much more complex system, and what's even more complex is that a lot of people who's working within this industry does not only have one role, but they actually have several roles. roles. So it can be a curator who's also an artist, who's also an administrator, or you know, several different roles. Next slide, please. Um, so, in light of all of this, we at DOD has discussed a lot of what we can actually offer. And what's currently going on is that there is a need for a lot of alternative systems, but the vast majority of cultural workers simply doesn't know about the alternatives that we as a community can potentially offer. Uh, next, next slide, please. So we've done a bit of uh, wishful thinking, and this is kind of the solution that we would love to see, that we get together, our community gets together with all the new technologies that we know that we can then offer to the art world, and together with them identify problems which, you know, will kind of create a trinity that offers a solution that's actually sustainable. Next slide. So, um, like MP said, we have used the uh, pedagogy of the oppressed as a um, frame for the current report. I'm going to pick up three quotes, which I think is really vital for us as a community, but also can be applied to the art community. An attempt to soften the power of the oppressor in deference of the oppressed almost always manifests itself in form, form of false generosity. So what does this mean when you think about the art world? Uh, next slide, please. So for us, especially our community and collaborating with the art world, I think it's really, really vital for us to actually consider who we are working with. Uh, it might be very, very tempting to go for more established collaborators, but it might not necessarily be the right one as they might, they might see projects or solutions like this as more as a vanity project than actually really wanting to facilitate change. Um, so I think first and foremost, actually just really identify the communities within, within the smaller communities within the bigger communities. And from there, choose the ones who's actually really, who needs change and who will actually drive the change that's needed and not just take on these kind of new technologies as a vanity project. Next slide, please. Must be forged with and not for. Um, this is also something that is really, really important for us to remember that we need to work with, with the communities that we're looking to help. Um, next slide, please. It's, it's always really honorable to take uh, interest within communities that's outside your own community and that should be celebrated by all meaning um, but I think also it's for us really important to remember to have active conversations with the communities that we're looking to work with so in this case the art world um, because we at DOD, DOD believe that it's super important that we work with this community to identify the problems rather than identifying the problems for them. They need to be part of this process to just really help us understand what we can do and how we can do it to benefit them. Another thing that's also really important or why we need to do this is because by doing this, there's also a bigger chance that we will actually onboard them onto these technologies rather than push them away. If we go in and identify the problems for them, it is more likely that they might turn their backs on us and say, actually, thank you, but no, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So this actually, this diagram from the book really kind of sums it up um, in the way that we think that it it's, it's a good way for us to reflect over this, is that it needs to be both action and reflection together with the communities that we work with. And by having both action and reflection, it will lead to work, which means conversations, which potentially can lead to work and establish collaborations, which you know will lead to practice and having theory really uh, put into practice and tested. Thank you.
Beth, you're muted. <laughs> I'll pick up there for talking about um, what this can actually look like in praxis. So both in the concept of this game that we're developing, which is um, a speculative design and simulation game based on uh, the open source work of Lagrangia, if anyone is familiar with that. And maybe I'll talk a bit more about uh, the direction we're going there at the end. But um, for thinking about, you know, how do we actually um, approach the mechanism design and, uh, like, uh, I guess, user design of this uh, system, then, you know, in order to protect the culture workers and these different members of the precariat, you know, this intersection that we are talking about between uh, the open source world and um, the world of culture workers, you know, both as analogs for each other and as supporting each other, then um, I want to just talk quickly through um, several different ways of framing this that can be useful. So one is regulation as design space, uh, the functional roles within the service ecosystem. And by service ecosystem, I mean, um, you know, the uh, services that are performed and uh, the value that is created by those services, as well as, you know, obviously the products generated and you know, what are the functional roles at every point of this uh, supply chain and ecology, um, the gaps in value exchange and um, incentive structure across forms of capital. So that includes, um, you know, obviously the labor, labor capital of producing works, but also the social capital and reputation that's such an important um, element of uh, you know, creating work, starting collaborations, and uh, organizing together in both the art world and the open source world, as well as, um, you know, the, uh, like, resource capital in terms of access to space and whatnot. So, um, oh, yeah, next slide. <laughs> um, so one uh, thing that, you know, is turning out to be especially relevant right now with, um, you know, things that are playing out with COVID is, um, you know, what can we understand about how uh, resources are distributed, how rights are recognized, how labor is compensated, and um, recognition of what Stina was mentioning about uh, the fact that people in these communities often play multiple different kinds of roles and all of them might not actually be represented in um, attribution networks and compensated accordingly. Um, so, you know, a way of doing that is looking at regulatory architecture. And um, so I'm going to run quickly through two examples that I think highlight this. Um, so the first one being, uh, you know, in this situation with COVID where so many, um, you know, people who are working in this ecosystem middle layer as, freelancers, you know, as creators, as, um, you know, people like me who are community managers, like developer relations people, you know, people whose uh, job and like livelihood is connecting, curating, um, you know, resource allocation, you know, the, the bottom, when the bottom falls out of, you know, events actually happening, then, you know, we, um, you know, the people who create all the different aspects of, um, you know, coming together and gathering in space, uh, you know, we end up having um, like our livelihoods threatened. And it's um, been really interesting to watch in Berlin when, um, you know, uh, there's like this, uh, I forgot what it's called, uh, the uh, allocation of funds for people who are freelancers who are out of work. And, you know, it's been really uh, interesting watching how that happened over the past week when I think it ended up being like 250,000 people were, um, wait, is that right? So <laughs> somebody remind me, but, uh, yeah, like we're applying for access to, um, you know, these funds to help people. And, um, you know, I think that is interesting in terms of what it shows about, you know, regulation that is designed to help a certain group and provide access, you know, to resources, because that means that, um, the precariousness of access to those resources is like recognized on a systemic level. And the fact that it's something that, um, you know, is not guaranteed work, the importance of that work for creating the cultural fabric that uh, influences other type of capital, et cetera. So it's basically, you know, by the existence of, you know, the defining functions of regulation, it uh, acknowledges these different problems and the different roles played with it. But you uh, that also shows, you know, the gaps to access of resources where, you know, people who you know, maybe rely on this type of freelance work for their livelihood, but fall into a regulatory gray area, you know, end up being disadvantaged, like with what MP was mentioning on with, you know, the unpaid internships, for example, like the fact 
of um, you know the government and enabling uh, regulatory access to certain resources shows that you know so much of you know the work that people do is not able to be quantified in um, you know funds that can be given to protect it. So for for example, you know people who have been trying to build up their artistic career or access to connections by doing unpaid resource uh, internships, you know how do you calculate the um, sunk cost and the opportunity cost, you know provided there and um, you know what that is able to kind of bring to light is, um, you know, an aspect of a broken system in which, um, you know, maybe re uh, reputation and social capital and, you know, opportunity access plays an undue role that ends up obscuring, um, you know, the value of the work that is being done in a way that can actually have uh, funds directed toward people and, you know, to go on a different track, but in the same idea of uh, regulatory architecture analysis, you can also look to what um, MP is going to go into uh, very eloquently about uh, intellectual property. So, you know, if you are thinking about um, this ecosystem as an attribution network in which people are generating, um, you know, and purchasing and, you know, moving around uh, property that's created, you know, uh, defining, um, like intellectual property is something that can either be, you know, contributed to the commons, but, you know, bought and sold is obviously, you know, interesting in terms of bringing up ideas of property rights and, um, you know, replication and all these things that, you know, they talked about really nicely in the work last year. Um, but again, it also kind of reveals this um, layer underneath in which, you know, if we are thinking about, you um, like work that is generated and labor that is performed as uh, contributing to and increasing the value of property. That also means that, um, you know, not recognizing and paying people for different types of labor within the system is rent seeking and free riding behavior. And, you know, which obviously we have all talked about at length in blockchain, but I think, you know, I really look forward to exploring this lens further in our research paper because, um, you know, in, terms of thinking, how can we support people in all of these different aspects of the commons that, um, you know, is transmitting value through their work, et cetera, you know, when are people rent seeking? When are they free writing? What is the work performed that they are free writing on? Because often, and uh, if we go to the next slide, um, often that ends up being work of functional roles that are number one, not necessarily recognized. And number two are often performed by people who, you know, going back to this uh, framework of, you know, like systemically recognized uh, functional roles, you know, people might only be getting paid for their role as, you know, a um, gallery assistant while also, you know, performing curatorial roles, performing really important uh, community organizing, like actually producing works themselves. And, you know, we can't have an analysis of how to change the system and how to reduce this rent seeking and free riding without understanding the functional roles, how they connect to each other, and how, you know, different individuals in the system can play, you know, these different roles. And, you know, I'm very lucky to be working with these two who have a greater understanding understanding of, you know, the um, different roles within the art world. But, you know, what I have come to understand from talking to them is, you know, within these supply chains of, you know, between uh, creators and, you know, purchasers or whatever of art, then you have, you know, people who um, have to actually handle the art, people who handle, you know, the insurance and protection of works, like people who um, are, you know, the handlers and shippers that are actually, you know, moving these physical objects between spaces and, um, you know, those who actually handle, you know, the ticketing and promotion and et cetera of events that means that people actually even have access to seeing this art, um, et cetera. So, you know, one thing that uh, I think is really lost or that we think is, um, you know, currently one of the issues uh, that leads to this, um, you know, like, model of free writing is the fact that a lot of times, you know, these individual functional roles that are so important for actually creating and disseminating value throughout the ecosystem are not uh, recognized in, you know, grant proposals and uh, funds that end up, you know, going to artists, except especially in situations where, you know, the middleman is being cut out from blockchain, et cetera. So, you know, having a thorough and defined understanding of not only what the functional roles are, but how they relate into each other is super important for the slight mechanism design of um, improving the system. So next slide. 
Um, and, you know, similarly, I already mentioned this a lot, but, you know, as, uh, you know, you kind of perform this ecosystem mapping and like, um, you know, uh, situation analysis of what is happening, then the gaps start to emerge in the ecosystem and, you know, choke points start to be identified in which, um, you know, the like labor is being performed or capital is being used in terms of, you know, this social capital of creating opportunities that lead to paid work or, um, you know, performing the different functions that are necessary for, uh, you know, for example, a performer to actually uh, make money from their work through selling the tickets and all of the labor of, you know, content creation and community organizing that goes into there by, uh, looking through this model and, you know, drawing in where's the gaps in regulation and how are or the gaps in regulation and, of course, the definitions that end up emerging from regulation, how do we then understand, um, you know, which functional roles are not being adequately compensated and recognized for their attributions and contributions to the network? Um, and how are they not being protected? Um, you know, for example, uh, I mean, obviously being American, the example that always comes up is, you know, with health insurance, it's like, you know, if people are uh, collating together all these different projects, but none of them provide a solid foundation of, you know, enough pay or health insurance, you know, how can we specifically make sure that people have access to these benefits to live even while, you know, being in the precariat? So, um, and then the next slide. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the key part that brings together all of this and um, also, you know, that uh, MP will end up drawing in with this, um, you know, framework of um, like recognizing IP rights, um, you know, how do we identify the incentive structures that, um, you know, create the flow throughout this ecosystem. So, you know, if we are thinking of a space in which there are these different points that exist in relation to one another, what is the direction of, um, you know, the power that is flowing through the system and how can we design structures that account for these incentive flows, you know, recognizing the rent seeking and free riding, but also recognizing, um, you know, the different ways in which these types of capital, like, you know, the labor capital, the social capital, the actual work product that's created, interact with each other, um, you know, to, like, honor the incentives that are already guiding people, because people will, you know, continue holding on to that, uh, as, like, Sina, you know, mentioned a little bit with, like, you know, people don't know alternatives, it's hard to even imagine that, you know, alternatives, you know, as we're seeing right now with kind of the collapse of, the way things have always been, you know, suddenly the space for more alternatives emerges. So we have the possibility to think of, you know, as we rebuild from all of this, how can we recognize incentive structures that were in place before and react against them? So I think that was all my slides. <laughs> all right. So these are these are my slides. Basically, we're trying to look for a solution. And how do we sort these out? The simple solution would be cross collaboration and pollination to protect oppressed creatives against the elites monopolizing markets throughout the protection of intellectual property. It sounds like I worked salad, I get it, but there's more than that. So let's put it in the in the frame of protecting the open source developers. We're protecting them and working on licensing will help protect the group from corporate takeover or, or technology of the or Oh, sorry. Oh, of technologies that were once born out of this content and oppression. The crypto anarchist movement was born out of this oppression. And we're seeing more and more people getting filthy rich and working on licenses that will eventually exclude us from doing very important work and also taking over the incentive structures in a way that we will all become employees. So for a, a simple analogy to this uh, slide is actually the Forbes 2007 article that said everyone's getting filthy rich and you're not. So <laughs> you can go read it, it's, it's out there. So, um, so basically we started our work towards uh, this goal of, you know, figuring out the incentives between the art world and the open source world in January 2019. In June 2019, we released a report with the solution mentioned above. However, nothing happened. So yeah, the means of explanatory. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk then about the common fight or lack thereof for inter intellectual property protection. 
The art world is dominated by a few powerful ones, as Tina already said. Open source is most of the times unrewarding and exhausting. Um, if you have been hustling for a Gitcoin grant right now, uh, you can get what I say. If you have been working on open source for decades, you can also uh, get what I said. You have also gotten exhausted uh, because of incentives, because of frustration, because of not finding the right license. There's exhaustion all over in both worlds. Blockchain has been taken over by corporations, centralized institutions, and what I like to call nouveau crypto oligarchs that leave very little room for independent projects. Uh, the leaders that we once had that were you know, born out of the oppression, that wanted to change the world, that proposed a new Web3 have now become filthy rich and are losing the you know, are losing the mission uh, more and more. And just uh, like this analogy actually came from the current situation, such uh, just as the patenting system oftentimes denies access to people to essential medication, the obsolescence of intellectual property and licensing laws by the elites sever the bond between the open source developers, the culture workers, and their work. Once something doesn't belong to you anymore, you lose the sense of purpose. And this happens a lot, and we're trying to alleviate it. So what can we do? We have the potential to create a free market where ideas, work, information, and art can be exchanged from person to person, setting up the market conditions in a straightforward manner. Um, there has been historical examples to do one thing or the other, but uh, both, like some, somehow the incentives were completely, uh, like, you know, they weren't really well designed. For example, uh, like a very, a very long time ago, maybe some of you remember, maybe some of you weren't even born. So Napster allows free access to music, but forgot about the incentivization for artists. And then the big oppressors took it down. It wasn't the, the artist with the guitar. It was you too. Uh, it was uh, universal music that took down Napster. So uh, the small artists, even though they uh, believed on free access or equal equal rights for everyone to get to music, uh, you know, they couldn't fight against that. Uh, and probably they didn't even want to fight. The same happened to the Pirate Bay and the big movie conglomerates and others. And then they accused people of bogus crimes, uh, you know, it, like but protecting themselves with the rights, uh, the rights for the movie. And to be honest, the rights for the movie should belong to the artists, should belong to the writers, should belong to the makeup artists as well. And um, one example that I really liked uh, actually came from uh, my own team, um, uh, the Golem team. So one of my colleagues, uh, Radek, uh, told me the story about how uh, uh, he helped, uh, he developed Darta, which was a website in Poland in the 1990s. That was a proper example of equal and uh, fair access. Uh, so it was 1995, and Darta was one of the first web pages for the Polish internet where anyone could, uh, could publish. There was some music, a lot of poetry, and electronic versions of scenes. Those scenes were originally DYI paper magazines multiplied by Xerox machines and sent by paper post. So obviously then uh, the struggle between uh, the law and equal access became too much, but this was a prime example how people could access the platform and do whatever they wanted and uh, keep, uh, you know, keep their creations intact. So um, I'm going to quote again uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. So more and more the oppressors are using science and technology as unquestionably powerful instruments for their purpose, the maintenance of the oppressive order through manipulation and repression. If it brings about to you and if it, if, if it touches a nerve, uh, then I'm absolutely right with my presentation here. So I'm just going to leave it for further, further thought. So why, like, if we find so many similarities between the creative world and uh, us here, and we're also creative by all means, uh, but uh, 
you know, we try to not say the art world because you immediately think of a, you know, like proper elite art world. So we're going to talk about creatives. So why is it still not working? The crypto art marketplaces were uh, at the start amazing. I Even I got some great uh, Xerox works that were probably from the start of the 2000s that were uh, digitalized and put into uh, super rare or uh, other marketplaces. And uh, then like slowly, they the crypto art marketplaces began uh, leaving culture workers behind to give room to crypto natives that wanted to tinker into art. This is absolutely positive. Don't get me wrong. You know, the crypto natives are already on board. It. They're not afraid to take risks. They're playing. They want to make their art and everyone has a right to express themselves. But giving the room to crypto natives only has left behind the proper onboarding of the culture workers. So it's it's still not fair. It's still not balanced. Then second, the art world still th uh, thinks that blockchain equals money, which is hilarious uh, right now. So uh, last the previous years we have seen a lot of examples of. Uh, the art world trying to interact with blockchains such as Christie's or uh, the platform very start that intended to uh, give certificates built on top of blockchain and a bunch of uh, a bunch on Ethereum as well. But uh, none of them seem to be widely adopted. It's also because you know the art world doesn't is not willing to learn. They just think that, you know, this is another strategy to get money, but they don't understand it fully. So, uh, so yeah, these are the two main problems. And both of these groups are actually close to the authentic inclusion of the other. By authentic inclusion is, uh, I mean, proper onboarding. Onboarding new users from a closed community is hard, but instead of throwing the towel, let's invest in education, show the art world that if they want to cut off the pie, they need to collaborate, not wait for out-of-the-box solutions, because actually nothing is out of the box right now in blockchain. And it was really frustrating also to learn that no one got the memo from our 2019 paper, even though it got a really good reception. And most importantly, there's no skin in the other game, in the other's game. It's, it's as I said, you know, the, the art world needs to take active part in building, a, in helping build our technologies. And we need to be better at onboarding as well. So um, another quote uh, from Paulo Freire, discovery cannot be purely intellectual. It must involve action, not can it be limited to mere activism, but it must include serious reflection. Only then it will be a practice. So work on what needs to be worked on. Don't rely on another group, uh, group to grow your fortune and then throw them away. Intellectual property protection and blockchains, smart contracts te technologies are actually a perfect match. So we should leverage this. A workaround. So let's, uh, let's think this simpler. Uh, blockchain wants more users. Culture workers want more freedom, and we all need uh, property, intellectual property protection. So, uh, am I the only one here seeing that there is a perfect product market fit that uh, we are constantly in the blockchain world searching for? And why, why aren't we doing anything about it? So, I'm, I'm just going to leave that as an open question too, because uh, I think that uh, we found a, work, a really good workaround and we should all think collectively about this. So, um, just uh, as a closing remark for uh, my section, I actually took inspiration for uh, my section from the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. I didn't take it from the art world. And it's crazy to see how everything overlaps and how everything falls into, uh, you know, the same category. We're being oppressed. Uh, the oppression is around intellectual property. So I'm not going to read this quote because it's very long. And uh, also, you know, I guess that everyone has it. It's not the cypherpunk manifesto. It's the crypto anarchist manifesto. It talks about cutting the barbed wire around intellectual property. So let's cut the barbed wire when, uh, then, you know, let's work together to do this. 
And okay, so uh, thank you. That concludes my section. Uh, to learn more, visit the website that's right down there below, or catch us on Twitter for the report number two release. Uh, Beth, you have something to say too? Um, oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then also, you know, I briefly mentioned uh, this uh, speculative design game that we are making around uh, all these. So, you know, if that is something that uh, you're interested in, we'll also be sharing that kind of along with the report and also co-creating this um, kind of uh, framework of, you know, trying to understand and get perspectives from, you know, throughout the world of both open source and culture workers for, um, you know, how can we model, you know, some potential solutions in the framework of this game and, you know, what are some of the mechanisms we talked about a little bit for, um, uh, you know, actually having regulatory protections for the commons through intellectual, I uh, mean, through, you know, people working in the commons through intellectual property, but also uh, identifying the problem space. So, you know, we really welcome collaboration on that and we'll share more materials about that and a way of uh, potentially playing this game remotely um, if that's something people are interested in. So. That's great. Um, that Thank was. You. That was a great, great way to to kickstart MetaTrack. Um, super interesting and also very, very um, good for for screenshotting. Um, this slide is amazing with all the quotes. So well done, guys. Um, Grace actually uh, posted two questions in our um, MetaTrack Discord. So Grace, do you want to ask them live? One is for um, for Beth and and the other for MP. Oh, sure. I love being in the spotlight. Hi, Grace. <laughs> Good to hear you, Grace. <laughs> um, so the first question was, and, and they're related to one another in some way. So the first one was for Beth about mechanism design. It seems like everything that we're talking about is inside the world of money. And money has a mechanism design about it that actually causes the problems that you're talking about. And if we're, not, you know, like some of these intrinsic things about money, for example, money is created by debt. That's how money, that's how 95% of the money is created today. And we don't value things with money. You don't measure, wow, that's beautiful. Or that inspired me. You don't pay for that, right? So these are mechanism designs that are intrinsic in money. So my question is, if you were going to redesign money, what would that look like? Because I think we can, right? We're in the crypto industry. How would you redesign the mechanism called money? Because as long as we keep trying to fix this inside the mechanism, I think we're going to be stuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, but I know you. You can you can handle the tough questions. I mean, I don't know. I am currently in a space of feeling like a lot of our experiments with redesigning money are uh, like not working out so well in the blockchain space in terms of, you know, helping uh, like creating enough stability for, you know, people to be able to live, uh, I don't know, in an accurate way. So I guess, you know, on one hand, uh, you know, looking at why a lot of crypto efforts have been failing and, you know, the second layer of like organiz organizing around tokens um it's not working out so well but i would say you know the other thing kind of going back to um analyzing you know incentive structures based on different types of capital i mean um you know a dream that like i have and you know i think we've talked about a lot is um you know uh increasing uh, recognition of and access to, uh, you know, types of systems where, you know, labor is able to translate directly into access of resources without necessarily an intermediary. And, you know, a great example being, um, you know, in uh, spaces where people are able to have access to, you know, a work trade, for example, where, you know, people are able to have access to a space, you know, through like a residency model or through performing labor for the space in order to then, you know, have access to uh, the network of people there, the, you know, resources for creation that are there, you know, being able to uh, have studio space or workspace, et cetera. So, you know, one thing that I'm kind of hoping to see with this increased instability that has happened is, um, you know, 
focusing more on, uh, you know, what are the very direct ways that performing, you know, different services, creating, you know, different things uh, is able to then translate into the things that people actually need that, you know, is being drilled down a lot in terms of, you know, access to healthcare, access to, um, you know, a certain level of stability for, you know, paying rent and all these things. So, you know, I would say it's less about like reinventing money and more thinking, you know, how can, you know, a direct peer to peer exchange of resources, um, you know, fill in for situations where money is failing. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. So my other question was for Maria Paula, and that was about, I have a real concern, like it's not about necessarily, it's, there's nothing wrong with taking out the middleman and having peer-to-peer, -peer, but I'm really worried because when I look at what happened with the peer-to-peer -peer networks in the recording industry, the amount of money in that industry dropped. So even if you divided all the money evenly among all the artists, there might not be enough for everybody. And it might even go down. So I'm concerned that this redistribution that you're talking about isn't addressing the problem that's really there. You're absolutely right. Actually, if you see it with Spotify right now, uh, the amount of uh, uh, the amount of times played that uh, people need to play every song for an artist to make some uh, like minimum money is absolutely crazy i'm not sure of the figures by now but it's absolutely crazy and uh, but the good thing is that they can put their money out there so uh, it's like it's not only our job as as open source people to develop these uh, these you know platforms or whatever you want to call it it should be done in conjunction with the industries you know we shouldn't expect uh, we shouldn't expect to do all the work that's unfair and you know if they want to keep uh, the market going as it is which is you know already a declining market because the record industry is basically unexistent right now it's been taken over by streaming platforms that are not necessarily fair as i pointed out then you know we need to establish a work stream that's sustainable for both parts i'm going to fill in on this as well and, and just uh, talk a bit more about the art world as well because there's a lot of thoughts and experiments that's currently going on with exactly this thinking about how can you redistribute money and op uh, opportunities because there is a big pool of money in the art world however it's extremely concentrated to a very few players like maria said or mp said before um and i think one thing that's really important with this open source and these kind of experiments that's going on with our community is to actually have these conversations with the communities in the art world or in the music industry because there is a lot of work that's already being done that we can benefit from and that we can gain a lot of understanding from but also where we can actually help them to push these projects into kind of right place where they want to be and where they can actually where they can benefit from the technologies and the knowledge that we have <laughs> 